Good morning, welcome to Council Parish Church. Every first Sunday of the month we have what we call our rock and roll service. And I'm standing here in our church hall, and usually behind me we have our worship band, JC, and the disciples leading us in song. And then following worship, we have a square sausage and a roll and a cup of coffee and a biscuit together. Unfortunately, we're in the midst of a pandemic, so we're in here alone, um, and it's my pleasure to have uh, Alex McLean and Stuart McLean leading us in a song, and Robin McLean is going to lead our sermon, and I'm going to be doing a bit later on. So, thank you for coming, and bless you for turning up today, and I pray that your service, this service, would be a blessing and a gift to you. Our story begins in the land of Canaan, where Jacob lived with his 12 sons. Now Jacob loved all of his sons, but his favourite was Joseph. And he loved Joseph so much that he decided to give him a coat, a multicoloured coat, which made Joseph's brothers very jealous of Joseph. Now, out in the fields gathering corn one day, Joseph said to his brothers, I've had the dream that your eleven sheaves of corn all turned and bowed to my sheaf, which made his brothers very angry. And so his brothers went to Jacob and said, Joseph has had this dream, which has made us angry. And Joseph said to his father, I've had another dream, that eleven stars and the sun and the moon all turned and bowed down towards my star. I wonder what that means. 
And that made Jacob angry with Joseph as well. His brothers, however, decided that they were going to kill Joseph. They attacked him out in the fields one day and they ripped up his multicolored coat. But Reuben, the eldest of the brothers, said, no, we cannot kill our brother. And so they threw him into a pit and left him there while they decided what to do. Reuben went back that night to free Joseph. However, what he did not know is the rest of the brothers that day had sold Joseph to some passing Ishmaelites and Joseph was gone forever, or so they thought. Our first reading this morning is from the book of Genesis, chapter 39, reading verses 6 to 12, and then 16 to 20. So he left all he had in Joseph's charge, and with him there he had no concern for anything but the food he ate. Now Joseph was handsome and good-looking, and after a time his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, with me here my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my hand. He is not greater in the house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not consent to lie with her or be with her. One day, however, when he went into the house to do his work, and while no one else was in the house, she caught hold of his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. Then she kept his garment by her until his master came home, and she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to me to insult me. But as soon as I raised my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. When his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, saying, This is the way your servant has treated me, he became enraged. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. He remained there in prison. The second reading is from Genesis chapter 50, reading verses 15 to 21. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full 
for all the wrong that we did to him. So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. Amen. The first of our two readings takes us to the house of Potiphar, an important man in Pharaoh's court. And here we again see the care that God is taking of Joseph. Despite being a slave, he worked hard and succeeded at everything he did. So much so that Potiphar put him in charge of his household, trusting Joseph so much that he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. But then we come to the bits that we heard earlier, and I don't remember these being discussed in Sunday school. They were glossed over, and that is the bit about Potiphar's wife and her attempt at the seduction of Joseph and the angry revenge that she took when he spurned his advan her advances. I can understand that the themes of this part of the story would be difficult to discuss with young children, for whom this is very much a story of a young man with a coloured coat who interprets dreams. But it is an area of the story that is ripe for exploration, with its themes of temptation and sexual impropriety. But for me, the key part of this is the reasons that Joseph gives for his steadfast refusal to comply with her wishes. For a lesser man, it would have been easy to succumb, but Joseph knows that he is favoured by God and trusted by Potiphar, and he is not willing to dishonour either of them for a quick fumble. And it is clear from the story that the pursuit of Joseph was a long-term affair. The temptation was daily and probably lasted for years, but Joseph was true to his principles and honoured his commitments to God, even though it cost him everything. However, by his faith and constancy to both God and Potiphar, Joseph, despite being framed for something he didn't do, is saved from the worst consequences of his action, partly due to the belief that Potiphar had in him. After all, he was probably aware that his wife was lying, why else would he not have put Joseph to death? However, taking no action was not an option, so he put him in jail. But because of his faith in God and his tenacity in not sinning, God ensured that the warden treated him well. And this is an important lesson for us all. Temptations are all around. Challenges crop up in our lives that sometimes it would be easier to give in to than resist. But if you do give in to temptation, be assured God will see it. And it doesn't matter what that sin is. Temptation comes in many forms, whether it be the sexual offerings made to Joseph or the opportunity to take something that doesn't belong to you or even having a barbecue in your garden with more than 20 people putting people's lives at risk. You might be able to convince yourself that no one will ever find out, but you will know and God will know. Are you prepared to succumb to that temptation? Which brings me to the final strand of the story. Our second reading comes right at the end, and a lot has happened in this time. You will know the basics from Sunday school. Joseph is freed from jail after he interprets Pharaoh's dream. He is put in charge of ensuring Egypt survives the oncoming famine. His brothers arrive in Egypt looking to get some grain to take back. Joseph sets up his younger brother as a thief and gets him arrested. His brothers go back 
and bring their father. And Joseph releases Benjamin and makes himself known to his family. And then Jacob dies. And the brothers start to fear, I don't think unreasonably, that Joseph might still hold a grudge against them for all the things that they did to him in the past. And for me, this is the single most important part of the story. Joseph forgives his brothers. He recognizes that everything that has happened has been as God willed it. Had his brothers not sold him as a slave, then he would not have been there to interpret Pharaoh's dream. And thousands would have died as a result. Joseph knew that his brother's actions were a result of God needing Joseph to be in Egypt. He knew that they did not realize this, and from their perspective, their actions were something to be ashamed of. It is a forerunner of the ultimate act of forgiveness, as Jesus asks God to forgive those crucify him because they did not understand the importance of their actions. And both acts of forgiveness are a first step towards the promised land. With Joseph, it is the children of Israel making progress to the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. With Jesus, it is the next step forward to the greater promised land, the kingdom of heaven. But in many ways, forgiveness is difficult. It certainly seems to be today. We find it hard to overlook harsh words or unkind actions. We find ourselves holding on to grudges and allowing open wounds to fester until things get so bad that they are, cannot be resolved by words. And we start to see situations like those we are witnessing in America and Hong Kong just in the past week. And this cycle of anger and aggression and hate just seems to continue. And we are getting close to a time where God's intervention will be required again. But this tide can be arrested. It is possible to pull ourselves back from the brink of a broken world and change the way society is working. And it all starts with three little words, followed up by some serious action. It will not be easy. It will require a lot of people to put their own thirst for revenge to the back of their minds. It will require everybody to be tolerant and loving and nurturing, and above all, responsive and trustful of people who they hate, sometimes for very valid reasons. And we will need strength of purpose to see it through. It will not be easy, as Joseph's path was not easy, and Jesus' path was not easy. But they knew that God was with them, and that gave them the strength to do what was required. God is also with us. So let us say together those three little words that can begin all of our journeys to the promised land. I forgive you. Amen. O oh God, you are holy, and in your holiness we find beauty and perfection, eternity, power and justice, and mercy, and compassion, and grace. And we turn to you, God, because there is no one else to turn to. You alone are the one who hears us, and you alone have the power to answer. Lord, as we look out, as we see what's happening in our own streets, our hearts are breaking. Look at what we have done to ourselves. We are destroying ourselves, and Father, your heart grieves as a parent who watches his children fighting one another. There is nothing new here. Cain slew his brother Abel, murdering him in cold blood. 
allowing his own sin to reign over him, to take charge of his hands and harden his heart against his own flesh and blood. O God, you have taught us thou shalt not kill, and yet we kill and kill again. We are all infected, like a virus that transmutes from one person to another. Racism corrupts us all. We fear and secretly hate what is different, what is black and brown and white. We share the same living space. We nurture the same dreams of peace and prosperity and safety. And yet we fight on as if there is not enough joy to go around. There are racist police officers and racist business people and racist shop owners and racist teachers and racist preachers and none are innocent. None are in a position to judge. Police violence is simply human violence writ large with a baton and badge and bullets and bombs, helmet, shield and gun. And the violence of protest and riot is no less wicked than those who abuse their positions of power. O oh God, beneath the dark canopy of a pandemic, a virus lurks that is far more subtle and far more deadly, the virus of hatred, and none are immune. There is no antibody, no vaccine save one, the blood of Jesus. It is his salvation that we yearn for, his forgiveness, his mercy that is our only hope. But it is also his glory that can be ours, the cloak of his righteousness that can cover us, his love and justice, his mercy and grace and forgiveness that is ours for the asking. O oh God, let us not be silent anymore. Let us speak out. Let us raise our fists, but not in violence. Let us instead beat our own breast, grieving and mourning over our own sin and not those of others. Forgive us our debts, that we might turn and forgive our debtors. Lord, show us a better way. Grant us wisdom and perseverance and an unyielding spirit for change and a more just society. Lord, save us. Save us all. Amen. Forgiveness. Need I say more? If only in the midst of these protests there were more who were willing to stand up and say, I'm sorry, and more still who would say, I forgive you. Friends, the good news is that in Jesus Christ we are all forgiven and made new, and the past is forgotten, and the future held secure, and the present is literally a present from God. Friends, I pray that you would discover that present, that you would know the sweetness of his blessing, of his mercy, that then you in turn might go forward and say, I forgive you. Friends, in the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he be kind and gracious to you. May he look upon you with favor and give you peace.